Hello everyone and welcome to the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research's Citizen Series Policy Pizza and a Pint on Building the Budget, Choices and Priorities. My name is Robert Irma and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. The Citizen Series is a community engagement pillar of our institute. The series brings policy and political issues to the broader community in an accessible format. By bringing together content, Sorry. I bring together content experts, policymakers, and practitioners on these issues. We hope to stimulate a dialogue with you and the broader community. Policy Pizza and Abide Pine is designed to situate and discuss important public policy issues facing Manitoba and Canada, and to have those discussions in an informal and informative manner. Our speakers for the evening are David Woodbury, Dr. Karen Lavasseur, and Dr. Todd Scarf. From 2003 to 2011, David Woodbury served as the Associate Secretary to the Treasury Board. Together with the Secretary to the Treasury Board, he directed the preparation and implementation oversight of eight Manitoba budgets. Dr. Levasseur is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Political Studies at the University of Manitoba. Prior to that, she was a Manager of the Policy Unit with the Province of Manitoba. Dr. Todd Scarf is Professor of History and Global Political Economy at the University of Manitoba. Prior to that, he held senior positions with the Government of Manitoba, including Director of Research and Planning for the Priorities and Planning Committee of Cabinet. Our moderator tonight, as he has many nights, is uh, Mr. Dan Lett, uh, I would say also co-founder of this series. Well, thank you, Dan. Um, Dan is a columnist for the Olympic Free Press, and he has been, uh, he's covered uh, politics uh, from every level, from the City Hall right to the uh, National uh, Bureau in Ottawa. So once again, I'd like to thank you all for coming out on a very, very cold, frigid evening and joining us for what should be a very interesting and informative discussion on what challenges and what goes into making budget here in the province of Manitoba. So with that, I'll turn it over to David. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Um, I want to start with an apology. One of the things about people who work in finance is we talk our own language. And uh, as uh, someone who tried to interpret things I was saying for news releases and other things once said, you have your own language, I, I'm only the only person who can actually understand what you're saying. So if I occasionally lapse into finance ease, I apologize. And I think during the question and answer, you can ask me about what it was I actually meant by uh, Part B budgets. It's, and so it's why I'm here, <laughs> to, to make sure that you know we understand. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> Um, I wanted to start by saying that uh, budget making is both a science and it's an art. Uh, and I want to say that because while a lot of work goes in from finance officials in terms of looking at the data and looking at the um, uh, past trends and the revenues that come in and the expenditure patterns from past years, uh, that there's also a lot of anticipating the unexpected. And uh, no one is particularly good at that. And as an example, there were 10 budgets last year from provinces. Four of them predicted that they were going to have uh, surpluses, and six of them predicted they were going to have deficits. Of the four who predicted uh, uh, surpluses, only two of them actually are going to have uh, surpluses this year. And all of them have actually poorer results uh, than they had forecast in the spring. So it's, it's not easy. And, and in a lot of the cases, the reason that this happened is certainly if you look at uh, uh, Saskatchewan, as an example, is that they had uh, a pretty bad situation in terms of natural disasters. So, with that in mind, I'm going to take you through a budget process. The day that the legislature approves the budget, usually in June, work has already started on the next budget. So, when you think about it, it's a, it's a 12 month process, maybe 13 months if you count the overlap between them. And so, it starts. As soon as the budget is approved, or actually before the budget is approved by the legislature, with officials starting to look at the results that they already have. And they're starting to look at the economic models, and they're trying to look at uh, what's happening in the economy, and they try to anticipate uh, what's happening elsewhere in the country. Um, and this continues right through until about uh, the end of the summer, at which point uh, the Minister of Finance is going to ask her officials, or his officials, Okay, tell me where we're at. Tell me, look at the base stuff that we put in the budget last year. What are we likely going to get for next year in terms of revenues and expenditures? And tell me what that means in terms of what we have available next year. And I'll bring that information to Treasury Board. Treasury Board will go over it. They'll make a recommendation uh, to Cabinet. 
cabinet will uh, go through it, decide what the priorities are based on their throne speech, based on their election commitments, uh, based on any policies that are under development within government, and they'll say, okay, this is what we want to see from departments this year in terms of expenditures, here's some priority programs that we think maybe you should look at including. Uh, with that in mind, uh, the staff and the Treasury Board uh, send out to each department their uh, target and request that they send in detailed estimates for the coming year. That's done, and that takes a, a lot of work from departments, and to be quite honest, departments actually start fairly early as well, starting to anticipate, see some of my former colleagues are nodding and agreeing, yes, we start really early, um, to try and anticipate what uh, they're going to need for the coming year. They put together just reams and reams of paper uh, with details in terms of expenditures, and they submit that to the Treasury Board Secretariat. Secretariat staff analyzes it uh, and will report to the Treasury Board ministers in terms of what's in there, how does this conform with the kind of uh, priorities the government has established, and uh, they will make recommendations in terms of what levels of uh, funding within the guidelines that have been established by Cabinet can be offered up this year for those departments. Now, um, departments get to come before Treasury Board, they bring their minister, uh, and they make a, a pitch for uh, their uh, priorities. Uh, but, you know, there are more priorities uh, than there are resources to go around, and uh, that is pretty much reality of any budget. I've been associated with about 15 budgets in my career in finance, maybe a little bit, a few more. And there's more priorities to go around good programs uh, than there are resources. And that's just the reality of uh, where we're at. Um, one of the things that um, is going on at the same time as folks are reviewing expenditures is they're also looking at, uh, finance officials are starting to look at what are the information, what's the information we're getting from the federal government, from economic forecasters. They're looking at what world events are going on, and they're, they're looking at the markets and the value of the dollar, because all of these have an effect on budget expenditures or on budget revenues. There are three key events, I think, from the federal government that are important to budgets. The first is going to be the economic update that usually comes in the fall. The government, federal government will signal what its priorities are, what things it has of interest to them, some of which will affect provinces. Uh, it could be they're going to offload some services. It could be they're going to reduce a tax that will put pressure on a province to follow suit. Uh, the second is the uh, finance minister's meeting in December. Uh, this is a fairly important uh, meeting for provinces because that's when the federal government will announce the level of funding it will provide through its transfer programs for health, for education, and for equalization. And at about $3 billion a year for Manitoba, that's a fairly significant uh, amount. And so uh, officials are always watching that very closely to see whether or not there's any surprises or whether things are going as expected. The final one is the, fe is the federal budget from the federal government, which comes in usually in February. And that can also sometimes contain surprises, programs are being dismantle or new programs are coming along, uh, the rules for infrastructure programs, that sort of thing can all affect how the budget is finally put together. Uh, the economic forecasts are important. Uh, all of the work that, uh, the, the modeling that is done by the Department of Finance in terms of how our revenues are going to grow is often based on how the economy is going to grow. And so uh, folks watch very closely what the forecast, the average of forecasters is from uh, various uh, things for nominal growth, because if you think about it, our retail sales tax and our payroll taxes and others are all sort of dependent on how well the economy does. And so that's very important to watch. Uh, the value of the Canadian dollar is important to watch, uh, because uh, a lot of uh, things may affect the economy, uh, it may affect the costs of uh, natural resources, for example, that government just pays to keep the, the shop open. In other words, get a big natural gas bill increase, uh, could, be, could be a problem. Um, finally, world events. Uh, you can imagine 9-11 uh, uh, sort of uh, kicked our budget all, all to heck, to hell, uh, when it happened in 2008. When it happened, it's one of the... It, it's YouTube, man. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
And it was a, it was sort of a defining moment for that particular budget year. You know, things have been going on on a particular trajectory that looked pretty good, and all of a sudden revenues sort of were dampened just because of that one event. Uh, likewise with the economic uh, uh, retraction, depression, whatever that we we suffered at the end of the 2000s, first uh, decade of this uh, century. Uh, it had a very serious effect, not just on revenues, but also on programs. Um, as well, there's sort of the consultation process that goes on in government, which is, uh, uh, which I think Todd can talk about a little bit more than I can, but uh, certainly the minister engages a consultation of uh, the public, uh, meet, meetings throughout the province, meetings with individual interest groups, whether they're uh, business groups, social groups, uh, employee groups, sort of solicit and to hear their points of view. Uh, they also, uh, I think the Minister of Finance and the Premier also pay close attention to their caucus because the caucus is also talking with more people on a day-to-day -day basis and has feedback that they want to offer in terms of how the government's going to develop its budget. So, Treasury Board Ministers have gone through everybody's estimates once. Uh, and they're short. They didn't quite make their targets. <coughs> and so they direct staff to go back and sort of look at other options that they will bring forward. About the end of January, everything is more or less in place. Different years, it's different times. Uh, and then the Minister of Finance will take the whole package to Cabinet, and Cabinet will go through it, and they'll either say, yeah, sure, go ahead with that, uh, or they'll say, we want you to do a little bit more work on this. Um, there's also work being done at Treasury Board and Finance in terms of revenues, uh, either that's fees or it could be taxes in terms of options that should be considered or could be considered. Uh, and those also are, are reviewed by Cabinet. Once Cabinet is signed off, uh, it's a matter of checking, double checking, triple checking. Uh, there are a, a tremendous amount of background material. I've brought two of the books here uh, that go into it. And it's, it's, uh, it's quite a, a labor intensive job to make sure that every single document is consistent. And that takes a bit of time. Speech is written. I have a, there's a former speech writer for government here who can tell you what a great fun that is. Uh, uh, but you know, that, that speech is you know, to put together the government's priorities, to sort of put the face on a lot of numbers that they want to put forward to uh, the public. And uh, finally, it's all put together. The documents are kept under lock and key. And it goes into the minister's hands, and the minister rises in the house. Uh, she presents her budget, uh, the legislature debates it, about eight days I think it is, and then they resolve into three committees of supply, and they spend 200 hours of legislative time reviewing the detailed estimates by department. And then in June, usually in June at the end of the session, September. okay, one year in September, <laughs> uh, usually at the end of June when the House wraps, they, um, uh, they the House will approve the supply for the, for the year. That's all the estimates for the department. They'll apply the Loan Act, and the budget will be passed. And then work starts in the next budget. There you go. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, David. Uh, have we decided it in advance? Karen? Yes, I'm getting a nod. Yes, Karen. <laughs> Karen Lovesser. Great. Thank you very much. And, uh, I do have an assistant here, Brent, who's going to help me with my PowerPoint presentation, so uh, you can follow along. So uh, David provided a, a very comprehensive overview of the budget process, and I'm going to take one particular slice of that, and that is the consultation process. And I'm going to um, pose some uh, ideas uh, and questions related to how specifically voluntary uh, and nonprofit organizations uh, work within the uh, work within the consultation process of the budget. So uh, as a good academic, I always need to define my terms. I teach my students this all the time, so I need to practice what I preach. What exactly do I mean by voluntary organizations, nonprofit organizations? Well, uh, these are groups that um, do not um, seek to make a profit. There's a little more than 8,000 of them in Manitoba. Uh, they cover everything from uh, sports, recreation, housing, health, education, religion, arts and culture. And what's perhaps, what perhaps a lot of Manitobans don't know is that uh, we rely very heavily on uh, voluntary and nonprofit organizations to deliver services to us, but also to provide us with opportunities for citizen engagement and also to represent us, our identities and our interests. 
Uh, in fact, um, Canada has the second largest voluntary sector in the world, um, uh, proportional to our economic output. And in turn, Manitoba actually has one of the highest rates of uh, voluntary sector organizations, uh, which means we rely on them pretty heavily to do a lot for us. So uh, when we talk about the budget process, uh, presumably we would think that nonprofit groups and voluntary organizations would have an, a role to play in uh, identifying issues, being able to prioritize uh, uh, some kind of aggregated interest. Um, so what, so, so what, <coughs> what is their involvement in the budget process? Well, before I launch into that, I just want to give a bit of a brief outline about what the budget consultation process in the province of Manitoba has traditionally looked like, keeping in mind that it will vary from year to year. But generally, um, the following can be thought as mechanisms for citizens and stakeholders to provide input uh, as to what the priorities and choices should be in the budget. So this would include uh, an online survey that anybody can fill out. Uh, there's going to be pre-budget public consultations uh, held uh, throughout the province. This year there were some in Gimli, Dauphin. Um, there's also the use of direct submissions, so you can actually prepare a submission and give it to the Minister of Finance. And then there are non-public meetings uh, with voluntary sector organizations or with networks such as you know, the University of Manitoba or the Manitoba Child Care Association or the Social Planning Council where the Minister can solicit their feedback in a very direct way. So that's the general process, but something actually very, what well, I would argue, very exciting took place this year. Uh, there was actually the incorporation of a telephone town hall, and this took place on February 10th uh, in the evening. There were two phone calls, one for rural Manitoba and one for uh, the city of Winnipeg here. Each phone call had a moderator, and there were polling questions that were listed throughout, and results were provided uh, uh, live on the call. And so uh, individual citizens, um, during the telephone town hall, were actually able to pose questions. Uh, so it was a bit of an interactive process in that way. And uh, I was able to discern that uh, at one point there was as many as 6,000 citizens on the air. So that, that is certainly a, a significant uh, outreach uh, uh, in that regard. So uh, certainly there's you know, good opportunities uh, for all of us as individual citizens and for nonprofits to participate in the budget process. So, leads me to my question. What involvement do nonprofits and voluntary sector organizations have? Well, I'm going to advance the idea that to answer this question, we actually need to understand a concept called policy capacity. And what do I mean by policy capacity? Uh, I put a definition up here on the, uh, on the board, and it says that it is the ability to collaboratively generate and apply knowledge, networks, contacts, and processes to ensure sound policy development, both in the voluntary sector and in government, in a way that benefits the sector <coughs> and the public. So basically, in short, when we're talking about policy capacity, it's about having skilled staff who understand public policy processes, who can actually feed into that, who can work with large data sets and work with uh, uh, individual case studies to show evidence to the Minister of Finance that there might be a pressing need. So policy capacity is about having those necessary resources. Now, of course, assessing the policy capacity of the voluntary sector is nothing short of an immense challenge. And the reason why it's so challenging is because the sector is inherently diverse in its size, uh, its scope, and certainly within its mandate. Uh, and so certainly there, you know, there, there probably will be attempts to try to aggregate the policy capacity, but uh, I'm concerned that given the diversity of the sector, it might be difficult to even tell a, tell a story about what that actually means for their ability to participate in the public policy process. What we do know anecdotally and through more qualitative research is that small organizations generally do not have a lot of policy capacity. And there are some larger organizations at the provincial or national level that might have more policy capacity. So I just wanted to share with you one example here in the region, um, a good example of an a network that uh, actively participates uh, in, the, in this process, in the budgetary process. And this is uh, SEDNET, uh, and so SEDNET is a national network and the Manitoba region um, uh, is certainly very involved in the budgetary process. It is a member-led network 
that works to develop economic opportunities at the community level. And you know, just to throw out a few examples here, some of their members include Wrench, which is the uh, Winnipeg Repair Education and Cycling Hub. I love that acronym. So appropriate. And SEED, uh, supporting employment and economic uh, development. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Uh, so SEDNET. So every fall, what it does is it actually works with its members to identify the key public policy priorities. Uh, and once that's done, uh, it then actually starts to set up a series of meetings with cabinet ministers, uh, Oswald, Bjornsson, Howard, and uh, Kevin Chief and others, for example. And then when it comes time to the budget, uh, for the budget consultation process to begin, it actually employs many of those uh, mechanisms that I outlined earlier. So it fills out the online survey, uh, it goes to the public uh, pre-budget consultation meetings um, and encourages its members to speak out in that regard. It then actually submits a formal uh, submission to Minister Howard based on the priorities developed by its members. And so all of this is done to try to you know, clearly communicate what uh, you know, this network sees as the choices and the priorities of uh, member organizations serving the community. And when the budget is released, it then does some analysis. And it will actually go back to its priorities and see if they were adopted, to what degree they were adopted. And it will actually communicate the results of, of that analysis. So you know, to what degree did, the, did you know, budget 2014 reflect the priorities of SEDNET? And so I, I really quite enjoy this example because it's a, really, uh, it's, it's a positive example of how uh, you know, a network of organizations can get involved. Uh, and clearly, this is obviously a network with some really talented individuals working at the helm and, and obviously they have the, the staff who are dedicated to doing this kind of work with some training behind it. So, but we know uh, anecdotally uh, that most organizations simply cannot do what SEDNET does. And that raises uh, an important question because if we work from the premise that nonprofits and voluntary sector organizations have incredible insight as to which programs are working, which programs are not working, uh, which 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 subpopulations are being left out uh, in you know within society? Then presumably they have a role to play in the budget process. So what can actually be done? So I've listed three examples here for government. I'll go through them really quickly, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have later. Um, and these are just my own musings, but I also did make sure to do my own research, and I reached out to a number of uh, uh, voluntary sector organizations, uh, talked with government to try to generate a compelling comprehensive list. So the first one is the need for more flexible funding that allows nonprofits and voluntary sector organizations to allocate uh, money to support policy capacity. And the one thing I want to note here is that the province of Manitoba is a very large funder of these types of groups. And certainly I'm the first to commend the province of Manitoba for having undertaken some initiatives in the last couple of years to try to improve the funding situation in Manitoba. Uh, it's worked quite hard to, uh, uh, in a pilot project to try to make the funding process more responsive to their needs. But that said, I, I, still, uh, I still think that there can be more that can be done by all governments uh, to better financially support the policy arm of the sector. The second thing to note is that um, there's not always a lot of trust within the voluntary sector on the use of surveys. Uh, you know, we have to remember that uh, the voluntary sector, nonprofit organizations, they serve some of the most marginalized citizens within our society. And there isn't always a trust with a very informal, uh, quantitative survey. And so I think that there could be a little bit of work uh, done there uh, to, to maybe, you know, look at other forms of consultation or maybe more, uh, more direct meetings. Um, uh, some of the groups that um, you know I spoke with said you know we're not really interested in prioritizing uh, predefined lists of, of activities. We're really interested in talking about how is this problem defined? Can we actually change that definition? Um, and the third one is uh, to establish consultations with uh, what we might call naturally occurring coalitions or networks to try to draw on the collective strength. Right, if we know that small individual organizations don't have a lot of policy capacity, it would make sense to work uh, increasingly with uh, networks and coalitions. And I just give a couple of examples up here on the board. Now, what can academia do to try to 
uh, in, encourage uh, greater policy capacity, uh, greater involvement in the budgetary process on the part of the voluntary sector. Well, I give a couple of examples here, and I appreciate any of your thoughts, given that I work in academia, and obviously this is an issue close to my heart. The first one is that I think academics um, can do more to uh, provide or, uh, training to voluntary sector organizations. So uh, MIPR uh, worked uh, with the United Way of Winnipeg last fall to put together a one-day workshop <coughs> on how government works. And this covered the basics of you know, actors, institutions, processes. Uh, and it also identified policy opportunities uh, with specific mention to the budget and what that could mean for their organization. And this was facilitated by two academics, myself included, and Dr. Andrew Rounce, who's in the uh, crowd tonight. Uh, so I think, good, I think opportunities like that could certainly go a long way to uh, trying to start to develop that awareness of the public policy process and help nonprofits see where they can fit, fit in there. And of course, I think uh, as uh, academics, uh, Dr. Scarth and I and others, uh, wherever it's appropriate, you know, we, we could and perhaps should try to incorporate the study of the non-for-profit sector in our curriculum. And last but not least, what can the sector do itself? What can the voluntary sector do? And I think, first and foremost, I think that it needs to acknowledge that it actually has a critical role to play in the budgetary process. When I was talking with a number of organizations last week, uh, one of them said to me, budget. Oh, we don't get involved in political processes. Not at all. And I was actually a little taken aback by this because I know this organization quite well, and it's actually very involved, uh, but, but it, 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 will, it, won't, it doesn't see itself as being involved in the political process of the budget. Um, but, um, and, and I think there is a bit of scariness uh, that's involved with getting involved with political processes. There could be fear of backlash from funders, uh, if, if, if it gets a bit too far, there could be accusations of uh, encroaching on partisan activities, which charities and nonprofits certainly don't want to do. Uh, but I think that um, all of us could, uh, could, could benefit um, by you know, working with nonprofits and helping them understand that they do have a crucial role to play, and it doesn't need to be seen as controversial. Uh, further to that, uh, certainly allocating staff time to work on these types of issues, uh, of course, which is related to the funding issue, but certainly that's a, a first good first step. <laughs> Attending workshops like the one hosted by MIPR on how government works or finding some other training mechanisms. Uh, recruiting skilled volunteers. So getting, getting a recent graduate from an MPA program. I'm looking at a couple of my students who are in the crowd who recently graduated and might be tapping their shoulder later on. Uh, to work with nonprofits uh, and sit on their government relations committees um, to help, you know, give them the expertise of why approaching Deputy Minister X might be really important for discussions on the budget. And certainly, we have a great uh, program here in Winnipeg called Spark, uh, which is uh, hosted through SedNet, and it's actually a, a matching and referral system to place uh, highly qualified. Uh, volunteers with organizations who are looking for very specialized skill sets. Uh, so uh, I hope that's a, a helpful start and um, I look forward to any questions and comments that you might have. Thank you. I think there was actually, are you still sitting on a microphone, David? Well, no. that's, that's it. Oh, it was his, okay. But there's another one over here, but Todd likes this one. Okay, it's warm. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> yes, that's right. So uh, Todd, now at the University of Manitoba, previously of government, unshackled now by the restrictions of working say whatever in I the want. inner sanctum. <laughs> well, Paul Vogt did an event here a couple of months ago, and he just he just spilled his guts. So <laughs> I saw Paul. I saw. <laughs> so he, the YouTube just, cut out just before, just when Paul was getting warmed up. That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, I, you know, I was just, Dan, I was just remembering um, that one of my favorite provincial budget days uh, was uh, when the provincial budget coincided with a federal uh, uh, leadership debate on TV here. And uh, Dan invited uh, me and a couple of my colleagues and um, a few other people, one of whom was the late Reg Alcock, to, uh, to sit here and watch uh, the debate. And um, uh, as David suggested, the, the, the weeks leading up to uh, budget day and then the, the days and then the hours leading up to the release of the budget are a uh, pretty busy time for, for uh, political staff and for civil servants. And uh, there's this a real feeling of relief 
relief release after the budget is released. Um, and the day but on budget day, the premier goes to um, the premier goes to meet with the bankers. Is that the next day? And the minister business traditionally council. the business council. That's right. And um, the next day meets with the private uh, sector finance people, and the minister goes to Brandon. Right? I for, I've forgotten all this. Paul? Anyways, um, the political staff go out and, and drink. Six and uh, so it was, it, was, uh, it was fun to be here that night, and that was the night, uh, that was the debate when um, uh, the late Jack Layton um, really stuck the knife into uh, the politically late Michael Ignatieff uh, and turned to him and said, you, you've missed more days in the house. And it was like we were watching a prize fight in here. It was really exciting and fun. So, um, good, good times. Yeah, it was, oh, that, was, that was fantastic. You know, I was, gonna, I was going to say that um, one of my favorite, that, I, that I, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm happy to, to uh, uh, and proud to be invited to speak as part of the, um, the Institute's uh, um, a series, um, having gone from um, the, the um, government to the university, I can say that uh, the um, MPIR had, really has a presence at the U of M, and it's a really good one. Um, and um, But anyways, I was thinking about how much I learned working with, uh, well, David in particular, and a few of my other colleagues. And one of the things I learned from David was that um, on the one of the Saturdays before the budget is released, we uh, would do, and I assume they still do this, what we would call the read-through of the budget speech, where the speech would be projected on the wall, and someone would read it out loud, and if, you know, someone would say, stop, stop, no, nope, we've got to change that word, we've got to change that word, and you can't leave until it's settled. And uh, uh, this is perverse, but that's my favorite day of the year. I love that, I love that day. And uh, David started a tradition probably years ago of uh, buying food at DeLuca's, cold cuts and stuff for that, for that day. And after David left government, I, uh, I caught that torch and I remember phoning him I was in a panic at DeLuca's on a Saturday morning saying, what do I get, what do I get, I forgot. And you know, they're going to be disappointed if I get the wrong Good speeches stuff. are determined by good food. So, uh, and the other, so the other thing I wanted to say was, uh, well, David began by saying that budgeting is both an art and a science. And um, I was, as a political advisor, more on the art side than the science side. Um, but as we got closer to budget day, I dealt more and more with uh, people on the science side, with colleagues in, in Treasury Board and in finance. And um, I, I want to say, particularly at a time when governments all over the place, and especially the federal government, um, is uh, cutting civil service jobs, um, as if that's as if there are no consequences. Um, I want to say that in Manitoba, I think we're very, very well served by our uh, civil service. Um, everybody I dealt with, all the senior officials at Treasury Board and in finance, um, were um, just. Uh, unbelievably uh, resourceful, uh, professional, patient, and so on. And um, uh, and when David talked about the uh, officials having to um, uh, revise the numbers and revise estimates and um, uh, work up the numbers, I, 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 you know, it's it's true and it's objectively true that in Manitoba we're very very well served by by our civil service. And I I, I just wanted to note that. Um, okay, so on the art side, um, a budget is. For every government ever, a budget is both a technical document and also a political document. It is, um, uh, it contains a kind of narrative, not just in the speech, but it, it's a part of a government saying, here's where we're at, here's, here's where we come from and here's where we're at, both in our mandate um, and also sort of how we relate to the opposition, to potential changes, to the, and here's where we plan to go. So of course it's a political document. Um, one of the things that kept occurring to me as I uh, was thinking about uh, my remarks for this evening is how much timing um, matters. Um, timing, of course, the release of the budget itself, the budget day is a, is a consideration. Um, last year, well, this year the federal government chose to release a budget that it didn't want to have a lot of legs uh, during the Olympics. Um, last year, the uh, Manitoba provincial budget was not the last one, but it was one of the last ones, and it was certainly one of the ones that came out after the federal government had um, released its own budget, which mentioned the um, uh, the new federal infrastructure fund that would require matching funds from the provinces. So obviously, there was the provincial government made a, a revenue decision that you probably all recall that uh, that uh, would not have been possible, would not have happened 
probably in that budget if the federal budget, if it hadn't come after the federal budget. So all of those kinds of things, but also kind of timing in a larger sense, which is that a government faces a certain fiscal situation and there's also the economic situation in the province and those things don't line up perfectly. So um, the economy might be strong, by that I mean employment, investment, growth. Um, uh, and the fiscal situation, uh, let's assume we're on our way up, lags behind that. Governor, government revenues will take a while to catch up to, to that kind of growth. Similarly, or I guess on the flip side of that, uh, uh, any kind of government stimulus uh, takes a while to work through the system and so on. So government is, is trying to uh, deal with the fact that uh, fiscal timing and economic timing are not exactly the same. And then another big uh, timing consideration, and this is especially relevant when we're talking about the fiscal timing, is where is the government at in the electoral cycle? And I think this applies, of course, to every government ever. Um, the federal government just released a budget that is, for all intents and purposes, balanced. But it, they are projecting a deficit. And I don't think it's any secret that uh, I assume that the reason that they're doing that, the mechanism to get there is largely through a big contingency fund, but the reason for they're doing that is because they want to balance, they want to uh, table a balanced budget going into the next federal election. And those are the kind of considerations that uh, every government makes around budget time. If you've got some unpleasant things to do, maybe on the revenue side, or if you want to cut some programming, every government would prefer to do that early in the mandate rather than later. Um, so timing is a big thing. The other thing that occurs to me about timing is that, you know, the, the process, especially uh, for political staff in communicating the budget, uh, has, has really has changed. And I remember the, um, who was the, I think it was a liberal finance minister who, there was a photograph of, the, of, a, of a document and that was, that constituted a leak. Mark Lamont. David, Mark Lamont, thank you. And of course, um, uh, Michael Wilson, there was the, in the late 80s, the, uh, the, the very, I think it was, what was it, Doug Small? Doug Small. So there was a leak, and that was, that was very, you know, that was, uh, that was uh, 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 scandalous. Um, the idea now that um, uh, in the Canadian tradition, the Canadian parliamentary tradition, that budget deliberations and decisions are made entirely um, in private and then sort of released when the minister stands in the house. Of course, that still does continue. We still have budget lockups. I've been in the lock federal and provincial lockups on, on different sides of that. Um, and the lockup is when um, uh, the media and, and interest groups get access to the budget documents uh, a few hours before the minister stands up in the house and actually get access to the minister and the premier. Um, but they can't leave and uh, they have to, their cell phones are confiscated and all the rest. Um, so yes, that continues, but at the same time, um, leaks or at least advanced storytelling is now the norm. And you know, I think really it was probably Paul Martin who started to do this, uh, as I recall, but really now this is the norm all across the country in every province. So the federal government uh, starts to say a couple of weeks before the budget, boy, you're probably going to see some stuff on employment training for young people. Um, and I think in the case of the last federal budget, the uh, uh, smoke or the hand-waving around employment training for young people before the budget was released was much more significant than the actual content within the budget on those issues. So um, whatever you hear in the weeks leading up to March the 7th, 7th? Sixth, thank you. Um, from the province, will be will be that will be that. So this is kind of the story, the story we want to tell. Um, similarly, on the coming out of the other side of the budget, um, one of the considerations that uh, political staff and uh, well, and civil servants and everybody make about what's going to be in the speech is how much detail do you release about specific announcements that you might rather announce in the days and weeks after the budget and what we call the rollout. And so you might say, um, in the year ahead, we will uh, make new investments in um, 
uh, you know, whatever, uh, innovation, right, or something like that. And then just leave it at that in the speech and try to give it uh, some prominence based on where you put it in the speech or how much real estate it takes up within the speech or whatever, uh, the minister's speaking points. Uh, because then on the next day, you want to make an announcement where you include the numbers. So there are those kinds of timing considerations and those are pretty fluid right up to the right up to the last minute. And I think it's safe to say it's not just in Manitoba, it's, it's all across the country. Um, now, on the issue of the story or the narrative, like what's the story you're telling with the budget? Um, the, the, the story is kind of introduced in the government's planning cycle a few months earlier in the throne speech, where some of the big themes and policy priorities are set out, and then they're concretized or crystallized or given some some hard numbers in the budget itself. Um, but I guess more generally, what governments are looking for with their story is to be talking about what they want to talk about. What's, what's to their advantage and what is uh, believable and what is true, of course, um, uh, but also what is uh, a priority for the public that's to their advantage. So just to, just to talk this through, um, you know, what would really be in the sweet spot for a government is to find an it to say that this budget is about an issue that, the, that uh, they know that the public thinks they are better at than the opposition and that the public cares a lot about. And so for the, for the past, uh, well, since the financial crisis, the federal government has, uh, and I have no insider information here, but I'm sure this is true, has said, um, the public is concerned about the economy. It's concerned that although Canada seems to be doing okay, the global economic recovery is shaky. <clears throat> it's concerned about um, jobs, and basically jobs in the economy. And that the public thinks that the conservatives, the public is inclined to give the conservatives uh, a bit of a head start on jobs in the economy. And so obviously that's the sweet spot for the federal government. So that's the kind of thing that, the, that in, those are the kinds of considerations that inform the way that uh, the government frames and communicates its budget. Partly the budget, partly the content of the budget, but also the way it's, as I said, framed uh, the story to tell. Um, <clears throat> another thing, though, is that there are things you want to talk about. There are things you want to, as a government, you want people to notice coming out of the budget. Um, there are things you want to highlight in the rollout. There are also maybe things you don't want people to notice or you don't want people to talk about or things you want to just have go away. Um, one of the best examples of this in recent history is in 2012, uh, the federal government made a bunch of cuts, which there is, uh, I think it's an open question how much attention the government wanted uh, paid to all of those cuts. Um, but this was the ELA, the Experimental Lakes cut, and they, they killed Katimovic for a second, or it had been killed and, and uh, revitalized, but anyways. Um, and that, that budget was when they announced that they were going to phase out the penny. And of course, the next day, the, all the headlines said, government is doing A, B, and phasing out the penny. And that was such an effective way to, one might uh, assume, draw attention away from the things that the government wasn't super excited to have coverage about, that actually around, in my circles, that became a kind of vernacular shorthand for exactly this thing. What, what are you going to put in your budget or whatever to get some attention uh, that, uh, to maybe possibly draw attention from things you're less, you're less uh, excited about? And um, so, and this is not just in Manitoba, I'm not telling any state secrets here. I know that, it, that I talk to people across the country, and the idea of a penny, or a really shiny penny, like we're doing something really nasty in this budget, we need a really shiny penny, you know, something that'll really, that'll really capture some debate and suck up a lot of oxygen in the days after the budget, is, is I think a new thing, but I think now it's permanent. It's part of the, it's part of the, part of the game from now on. Um, uh, okay. Um, two more points. Um, the, so what's, what's big right now? What's the issue that's big right now? One of the issues in Manitoba and across the country is infrastructure. And I think that uh, 
there, uh, this is, uh, governments have polls that tell them this. I think though that, I, I just want to kind of make an observation that it, this is a tricky thing for governments because my guess is that when people say they want investments in infrastructure, it's partly because they think that, you know, they've driven near Polo Park recently and they realize how, how grisly that is. Um, also, I know from research and just anecdotally that um, the public likes stuff you can kick. They like, they, they really like uh, construction as evidence of progress and um, really are very, are, are very willing to pay more uh, taxes if they know where it goes. And the cleanest way to do that for a government is to say, you pay gas tax, it goes into roads. You pay this, it goes into that. It, it goes into an obvious um, uh, improvement. Um, the challenge there for governments is that what I think a lot of the public th thinks about uh, infrastructure as a priority is a kind of meat and potatoes thing, which is, okay, yeah, like I wouldn't mind paying a little bit more if they fix the potholes, is not what the Business Council and Centerport and other groups in Manitoba and, and federally uh, other groups have been saying, we need strategic infrastructure. Strategic is, infrastructure is important. It has a stimulus effect in the short term because you've got to hire people to do that, that work. It has a stimulus effect in the long term because it improves the efficiency of your economy. But governments are going to have to do more than just say we're spending on infrastructure. They're going to need to sort of tell that story about why strategic infrastructure is important and also make investments in strategic infrastructure that people feel in their everyday lives. Um, so finally, here's my PowerPoint. Um, so here you go. This is, uh, this, is, um, this, is my, this illustrates my point about uh, setting the frame uh, for a government, talking about what you want to talk about. Um, so five years ago, I guess, the NDP is elected in Nova Scotia. And they calculated, I think, that they would probably get a second term and they needed to um, make their hard decisions early. So the very first thing they did was to get in a fight with, um, uh, was it uh, college? I think it was uh, public uh, college uh, teachers or something like that. Uh, in contract negotiations, they went after uh, civil servant uh, pensions. They had a real austerity kind of budget. and. Um, their prize at the end was they got to run on, we balanced the budget after four years of pain. And so this is a cartoon uh, that it shows the former NDP, pre thank you, uh, former NDP Premier Daryl Dexter. Uh, he's holding up the Stanley Cup labeled balanced budget and there's a pollster, you can tell because it says on his hat, pollster. Uh, and he says, the bad news is you were just voted the least likely to balance the budget. So, um, thanks. So I think this illustrates that, um, uh, the, well, in this particular case, the people who care about a balanced budget, for whom it's a vote determining issue, are probably unlikely to naturally vote NDP in Nova Scotia. And so even though the NDP inflicts all this pain and does all this work, um, running on a ballot question of who, can balance, who do you trust to balance the budget, or who can be toughest on, on austerity or whatever, it is uh, probably not a winner for them. Um, I raised the issue of the federal cuts around the ELA and so on. Uh, is it, it's an open question about whether that advantages the federal government. Well, I, my personal assumption is no, because I think that the people who want to see cuts to the, to the federal civil service um, already assume that Stephen Harper is their guy. And they don't, he doesn't need to, to prove his bona fides as a uh, uh, scissor hands cutter, but that just goes without saying. Um, so this all sort of informs in some way how you frame uh, the story or the narrative or whatever of the budget. And, um, you know, as David said, uh, these, uh, these decisions, the numbers start to come in very early and they do change at the margins, but they, you know, we have very good numbers in Manitoba and they don't change that much. And whatever the federal government does, of course, has a big influence. But um, the government does want to sort of stay agile in, in how it uh, communicates, the fine points of how it communicates the budget. And so uh, for those of you who are watching the budget over the, uh, in uh, uh, early March, um, I think that's something to, to watch for. What, how, how, does the, how does the provincial government 
uh, tell the story? How does it use the government, this budget to tell the story of where it's at uh, in its mandate? Thank you again, everyone, for coming this evening and enjoying this policy pizza and pint. Look forward to seeing our next ones. Check our website, MIPR.ca, for upcoming events. And look forward to seeing you soon. I'd like to thank our panelists once again.